If you want to join the Mile High Club, that's the place to do it. <laughs> JFK International Airport, New York, here I come. Well, the girls are all broken hearted about my leaving, so the uh, uh, non pair put on makeup for me to go away. <laughs> I would think that if I were coming in, they should be doing that. And This is an Asian practice that just, uh, I think, is amusing. They drink beer with ice <laughs> and a straw. So yeah, they're, they're broken heart. They're assaging their broken heart <laughs> with a couple of bottles of beer. <laughs> yeah, they're gonna be fine. And just like that, I find myself sitting by the Lehigh River in Pennsylvania, in the United States, in the Pocono Hills. Don't you wish it was that easy? It was actually a 32-hour trip from door to door, a little bit stressful at times. And while in my last video I said that I was going to do a critique of uh, Qatar Airlines business class, and I am going to talk about that a little bit, I've changed my approach just because of some experiences I've had since I've been back in the United States. It's an interesting time uh, to be alive and experiencing things because a lot has changed. Uh, everywhere, all over the world. And uh, so that's what I'm gonna talk about here. Come on along for the trip. I'm walking along a hiking and bicycle trail just south of Jim Thorpe, Pennsylvania in the Pocono Mountains or the Pocono Hills, if you're reasonable. They're not very big mountains. But this part of the United States was uh, developed early uh, by Europeans. There were uh, indigenous people living here for centuries. But the early settlers discovered coal in this region. And as the United States started to grow, especially the nearby cities of Philadelphia and New York City, which is about 100 miles away, Philadelphia is about 65 miles away, um, coal became a very important resource. And this trail was once a railroad bed uh, that helped cart the coal out of the, out of the hills. And now it's just a pleasant place to walk alongside the Lehigh River, where I was standing just a moment ago for my kind of opening statement. And I like it here. It's especially pretty in the springtime. So yeah, about 10 years ago, I flew into Singapore for the first time. It was my first trip to Asia. That actually happened 11 years ago. And I flew coach from New York City to Singapore. And when I got off the plane, I felt like I had been beat up. It, uh, the trip was a total of 20 hours inside of an airplane and sitting in coach. That's not particularly comfortable. It took me three, four days to uh, recover from the jet lag. And so for my first trip back to New York to go visit, I was offered an upgrade. I, I flew on Qatar Airlines, which had a good price for coach. And the night before I left, they offered me a business class seat for, I think it was about $600 for, for one way. And, uh, and I thought, yeah, I'm gonna go for it. And I bought that seat and I was treated like a king. It turned out that the reason they were making the offer is because the Airbus A380, uh, those double, uh, gigantic double-decker aircraft, they're the largest uh, passenger aircraft in the world. They are enormous, it's pretty amazing. And um, I, uh, I was one of the few passengers on board. The whole upper deck of that airplane uh, was, and still is, dedicated to business and first class. There's only a, a handful of seats up in the front of the plane for first class, and the rest is all business class. And this flight was nearly empty, so I had all of the attendants uh, taking care of me. And it was, it, it, it was, it was, What's the word I'm looking for? It, it was opulent. It, you know, the, the food was wonderful. The presentation of, of, of the meals was wonderful. Uh, you had a menu that you could order from. They had a little mattress they gave you for the seat that folded down into a flat bed and, uh, you know, complete with an entertainment system and a little space that uh, provided you with some privacy. It was a wonderful way to fly. And they ruined me. I, I can't fly from Asia to New York anymore on coach class. I just can't do it. So what I do is I save up and fly business class, which I've been doing mostly on Korean Air for the last nine years. So I bought this Qatar uh, ticket 
just recently to come on this trip. And I wanted to do a comparison. Are the, is Qatar business class still as excellent as it once was? Because they certainly build themselves as that. They build themselves as the most uh, uh, prestige way to fly business class in the world. They cater to a very wealthy population. Qatar is a very small country near Saudi Arabia, and it's oil rich. Uh, most of its residents are, are wealthy people. So they cater to uh, you know, wealthy clientele, and they provide uh, services for those people that, uh, that, that they're used to. You know, they're used to fine dining. They're used to nice stuff. And, uh, and that was the promise of business class on Qatar Airlines. I'm sorry to report that I was disappointed on this particular trip. Perhaps my expectations were set rather high from that first experience with Qatar Airlines many years ago when I took my first business class flight. But I have to add that the crew, the attendants, the people on the aircraft couldn't have been nicer. They couldn't have not have been more attentive uh, their service was was impeccable. The uh, the lad that was assigned uh, to my seat to taking care of the section that I was in was a great big good looking French boy. I would say was around 28, 29 years old. He looked like an athlete, and um, and he couldn't do enough for me. I mean, uh, he uh, present. You know, I told him they have a, a, a welcome aboard drink. And Qatar um, is, is, is known for a bunch of uh, non-alcoholic cocktails that they serve. You have to remember, uh, a lot of their clientele are, uh, are uh, Muslims who, uh, who generally don't drink alcohol, and I don't. So uh, he was going over the list of, uh, of drinks that were available. And I told him, well, why don't you just choose for me? And, uh, and he brought me back this uh, fizzy drink that had mint in it. Uh, which made it green. Uh, it was it was very pleasant, and uh, he continued uh, to provide superb uh, superb care and attention to me throughout my flight. The food, on the other hand, was disappointing. I had a roll that was hard as a rock uh, with my entree. The presentation of of the meals, however, was impeccable, uh, as was all the service on board the aircraft. The uh, my layover in Hamad International Airport in Qatar. Uh, there are showers available for business class uh, passengers, but, uh, and I only, I had just two hours. So I was kind of wondering, am I gonna have a chance to take a shower? Because it is really, when you're flying for more than 20 hours, you get a little two hour break in between the six hour and the 14 hour flights. It's nice to shower up and get ready for the long 14 hour flight. Well, I couldn't take a shower because the uh, airport, not just the showers, but the airport in general, while it's a new airport and it's, uh, it's very modern and it has a lot of modern amenities, it's overwhelmed. It was, there were just too many people there for the staff at hand. And that was true for the showers as well. I, I couldn't get to take a shower, which I was really annoyed at. Had I, d had I done the, uh, the review of Qatar Airline uh, in Hamad International Airport, it would have been a very poor review. I got on my flight to New York. Uh, second leg of the trip is on a 777, also a pretty large aircraft, not as large as the A380. But I was greeted there with, a, uh, with, a, with even more privacy. It had a little uh, uh, cubicle where the seat was that you could slide a door closed. And, and you know, if you... <laughs> If you want to join the Mile High Club, that's the place to do it. <laughs> I was traveling alone. So um, the crew there, as on uh, the first leg of the flight, couldn't have been more attentive. The meals were okay. I don't want to trash them completely, but the food wasn't particularly impressive. The presentation was. They set it out to, to look really special and, and, and classy, but it was, it was just kind of ordinary at best. And there were a few real disappointments in, in the things that they presented. So that disappointment, you know, had me, oh, gee, I, you know, if I'm going to do a review, I don't want to make something up about it. You know, it's like, you've got to be factual. But I did talk to one of the attendants. 
you know, it, even the French guy in the first leg, I told him about the role and a few other complaints I had about it. And he was, he, it was like he was crushed. He took it personally. Oh, I'm so sorry. And he says, some of these things are out of our control. Uh, the, the, uh, the, the people who cater to the airline, they don't cook the food on the airplane. You know, it's, it's catered by a catering company and it's put together and presented by the crew on the aircraft. So the presentation was impeccable. The food was not their direct responsibility. So with that in the back of my mind, I began to realize that anything that Qatar had um, direct control over was done with excellence the same kind of excellence I first experienced. And the places that were short of, of, of excellence were companies that were a little bit outside of their direct control. Now, I don't want to let them off the hook completely. They have to manage their business, that's for sure. But when I got here to Pennsylvania, my daughter's house in Pennsylvania, one of the first things I did was I went and took a Bikram yoga class. For those of you who have been watching me for a while know that I've been practicing Bikram yoga for about 22 years. Uh, I also teach it. I haven't taught in the last two years, but it's something that I intend to do soon. And I went to a, uh, a new Bikram yoga studio in Allentown, Pennsylvania that had just been opened up by a friend of mine, Jim, uh, Jim Pfeiffer. I had went to Bikram yoga teacher training with him back in 2005, um, and he opened up a new studio. So I went to take a class. And it was, uh, the Bikram yoga class is very demanding. It's a 90 minute class in a hot room. Jim's studio was heated up to over 104 degrees. That's 40 degrees Celsius. And uh, he had a really good young teacher that put everybody through the 90 minute uh, pos 90 minutes of postures in the class. It's a demanding 90 minutes of exercise, which I know I've done it thousands of times, but I'm a little out of shape. And I told the teacher that beforehand, and uh, so he would know. And uh, I was in the class with six other people. And during the class, I began to realize that everybody in the class looked like they were in my category. There weren't any really young people there. The, the, of the six people, I would say they were between 40 and 60 somewhere. And they all looked to my teacher's eye, my yoga teacher's eye, as if they had a practice. You know, they knew the postures and they were having a little bit of difficulty, same as me. And it dawned on me, we've all been subjected to two and a half years of, of sickness and lockdowns and, and, and just a general malaise. And it somehow occurred to me during that yoga class, I, I mean, I kind of knew this anyway, but it, 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 it came home to me that the entire globe has been affected by this pandemic that I hope is behind us for good, or at least fading away for good. And it's had a, 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 a depressive effect on everybody and everything, including Qatar Airlines. So I decided to cut them some slack and I started to think about the whole experience, not that, you know, a major airline company from, you know, a wealthy nation in the Middle East needs, needs an attaboy from me. That's not, not my job, but you know, it, it the general, um, uh, kind of feeling about it for me was, you know, I'm in this position. I'm not, uh, I'm not in a state of excellence, uh, at least not with my yoga practice, because I haven't been practicing a lot over the last few years. I went through the same kind of general malaise a lot of people uh, experienced. And, you know, for those of you that follow finance, know that there's all kinds of issues that have arose from those lockdowns that have slowed businesses down and they're just getting caught up. You know, everybody's trying to get back up to speed. And I noticed it here this time in my trip in the States because the States are kind of back to normal for the most part. I was here over the summer and, you know, I went back to Thailand last July and the United States was kind of emerging out of the whole COVID crisis is at the end. And, and now it's kind of emerged. I mean, there's not, the, the, you know, people are out and about and traveling and they're filling up airports and they're filling up, they're filling things up. But the businesses haven't completely caught up yet. You know, they're still trying to hire staff, you know, they're all short staff. As it was clear to me when I reflected back on it was the problem in Hamad International Airport. They didn't have enough staff 
to manage the hordes of people who are looking to get the hell out of town and fly and go somewhere and get back to normal. So yeah, I'm cutting them some slack. The people on the aircraft were wonderful. The working people that I interacted with couldn't do enough for me. Uh, they, uh, their employers should be proud of them. They, they, uh, they set a high standard for themselves and, uh, and they do their best to live up to it. You know, the food was a little less than excellent, but it was okay. I mean, there was, there was some good stuff too. The desserts were particularly good. You know, the aircraft was clean and comfortable with lots of little amenities and an entertainment system and things like that. And they did get me from Bangkok to New York safely and on time. So what I've concluded from this experience is we're all in the same boat here. You know, this, this pandemic has affected just about everybody around the world. Some countries more than others. The United States was particularly hard hit. And um, we, we got to, I, I think what we need to do is be a little bit compassionate with one another, a little bit patient and a little bit supportive of one another. As we emerge out of this, it's, it's a new, it's a new paradigm. How's that word? I don't really like it, but I think it applies here. It's, it's, it, we're, we are indeed in a new paradigm. You know, after what has occurred and what I hope is behind us, you know, the world is in a different place and it is a global thing. So yeah, that's what I resolved is to be a little bit compassionate and patient and understanding that everybody is, uh, is you know, is not quite back up to speed. And if they're doing the best they can, then I got to give them an attaboy. And I think certainly the people on the aircraft were certainly doing the best that they can. So uh, I'll reserve my detailed critique, maybe for the trip back. I don't know, maybe not. I, I don't know if I want to do those kinds of videos, but you know, I was, you know, for a long time flying from Bangkok to New York and I thought maybe I would make a video about it. But I think this is more important. So, you know, like what can I derive from the experience that might be helpful for people who are still watching <laughs> and if you are still watching thanks for watching and i'll see you soon i have another couple of videos planned coming up soon so thanks for watching